Hey, Dr. Danielle. Hey everyone, Dr. Robert Eaton here. Today is June the 20th, Tuesday, and I have just a second. Hey everyone, Dr. Robert Eaton here. It is June the 20th, and I have with me Dr. Danielle Eaton. No, we're not related. We just have the same last name because our husbands have that name. And um, we're excited to talk about chiropractic today and being women in business and all that that entails. So Danielle, let's just start for those who don't know you. Um, tell us about your journey of how you got to where you are now, where you went to school and all of those good things. Well, we had the same chiropractic school alma mater. We both went to Logan and I graduated from Logan in 2008 with my doctorate. And then um, a week after graduation, I was a faculty member. <laughs> I was a resident in sports and rehab for two years. At the end of my residency, I was promoted to assistant director of sports and rehab. So um, that was how I started my chiropractic career. I like hit the ground running in sports medicine, in sports chiropractic, um, a week after graduation. <laughs> there was, um, it was an intense experience. Intense doesn't even cut it. Um, people that know my mentor from my residency, they, they know <laughs> what the experience was like. I felt like he was cramming his 30 years of clinical experience into our brains most days. Like he knew that he had two years essentially to train us. And it was, it was definitely an intense experience. Um, a lot of hours working. There was one week that I literally worked a hundred hours in eight days. And there, as crazy and as hard as intense as that experience was, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was amazing. Um, I learned, I learned things that I wouldn't have been able to learn on my own in practice otherwise. And I felt super fortunate <laughs> to be a new graduate and then, you know, have a, a steady paycheck essentially just a week after graduation, have the benefits of being a faculty member at Logan. And then two years after that, be promoted to assistant director. Um, so... After I had my daughter, though, my first daughter, things really started to change <laughs> for me. And um, I had gone to chiropractic school because I wanted to combine my marketing and social work undergraduate degrees and experience in work and own my own business and help people. And after she was born, I was like, I am not doing what I came here to do. And as much as I loved my job at Logan, as fortunate as I felt to have it, I just didn't feel like I could do it the same as I had before I was a mom. So I went out into private practice and I took with me my work ethic <laughs> and, um, and the hustle. And that was definitely a good thing. I grew my practice really quickly, but I found that I was still kind of, not kind of, I was working more hours than I had when I worked at Logan. And I felt more overwhelmed. <laughs> by you know taking on the responsibility of being a business owner and um, having payroll to pay and having rent to pay and then also trying to be a mom and a good significant other to my now husband as well so my journey through chiropractic didn't look like I expected it to look because I, I hadn't reprioritized my goals in my definition of success as a chiropractor with having had a family after that. It took me a long time to really work through those things and um, become the mom that I wanted to be and for that to be okay for me and make, cha make the changes that we needed to make in our family to do that. Um, but along the way, I learned a lot of really important lessons, right, as we always do, which um, led me to creating a whole different practice, um, literally in a, in a different town, um, probably 60 miles from where I started, and um, helping other moms through the same kind of journey, like growing their practices, but doing it in a way that works for their families too. Okay, so, so you did an internship at Logan right after graduation and that was all sports 
sports kind of stuff. And was that on Logan's main campus in yeah. Chesterfield? Oh, okay. And yeah. so, so what led you down the sports route? That is, oh gosh, that's a really interesting question. So I was married once before. Um, I got married before I went to school at Logan. I was 23. I was really young when I got married. And my husband and I, when I first went to chiropractic school, it was, my plan was that I was going to be a chiropractor and um, he had his own career and he was a bit older than me. So we had started trying to have a baby while I was in school and for a total of five years, actually, like while I was in school and then working at Logan as well, I um, couldn't get pregnant. And while I was in school, I really was interested in pregnancy chiropractic and uh, working with infertility patients and babies and children. And then I couldn't have my own, right? So I felt like while I wanted to have that kind of practice, I, I didn't feel like I could because I wasn't, I wasn't a mom myself and I was really struggling with that piece of my identity. <clears throat> so I thought, well, I better explore other options. <laughs> and um, while I have like participated in sports, I never really considered myself to be an athlete. But um, yeah, I think that was really, as I look back on it now in hindsight, what led me down the path of considering sports chiropractic as opposed to what I had initially thought that I had wanted for my practice, which is actually the practice I have now. Okay. So sports was like the second choice because you were wrestling with personal stuff surrounding the niche you wanted to be in. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. why did you feel that you couldn't serve in that niche? Mm, I felt like I had to be legitimate or congruent, right? Like how could I say chiropractic can help you through your infertility struggles if it hadn't helped me for five years? Um, and that was really challenging for me, especially as a student and a new doctor, um, how to rectify that. And I, looking back on it now, it was probably a, in large part because our relationship wasn't the right relationship, obviously. We ended up getting divorced, and then I had, I'm pregnant now with my third um, baby, and they all came so easily. <laughs> They all came so easily. So, um, you know, while I felt at that time, like I wanted to blame something, it, I was probably blaming the wrong thing if I had to yeah. do something, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So then, then you have, while you're still at Logan and working 80 to a hundred hours a week, was that like <laughs> a regular thing or was that like, it just happened to be uh, one week or is that how things usually were? Mm, on average, we worked between 60 to 75 hours a week. Okay. And then when you opened your practice after having your daughter, at first you said you were working even more than that in your practice while you had your daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And not necessarily always in my practice, right? Because obviously in a, in a brand new practice, you're not treating patients for 60 hours a week. But I, I had a hard time separating um, – or identifying what was really important for me to focus on as a new business owner. And I felt like I had to say yes to every opportunity that came my way to grow my practice. Mm -hmm. And while in some cases that might be a good thing and it might really be necessary. Um, and it did help me grow my practice to say yes to everything. It also was really, really stressful for me. Um, uh, as a mom, particularly, I only saw my daughter for probably a year or longer. Like when she was asleep, I'd get her up in the morning, get her dressed, hustle out the door, go to work, and then I'd pick her up. She'd fall asleep in the car on the way home, and I'd put her in her bed. And that was how we lived life every day. And how long did you keep that up? And that practice was 60 miles from, from Chesterfield? Um, that practice was in Afton, which is just outside oh. of St. Louis City. Um, so like St. Louis County, like Chesterfield is. Um, but I don't know exactly the proximity from Chesterfield to Afton. I would say 20, 25 miles or so. Okay. And so then you did that practice for how long? Um, let's see. 
three, I think it was three years. Okay. Um, when I, when I had my first daughter, pregnancy to me felt so much more challenging, even a healthy, normal pregnancy like I had. I, I mean, all my pregnancies have been. Um, it just felt like, whoa, this is way harder than I thought that it would be. And then being a mom too, being a mom was physically harder, emotionally and mentally harder than I thought it would be. I thought, I'm like, I'm one and done. This is, this is good. Um, I did this once. Awesome. I love my daughter, but I don't think I want to go through that again. And a part of that too was truthfully because I was so focused on my career um, that I thought, well, gosh, how in the world could I have another child and still work this hard. And as the universe does, as God does, I, I was presented with some big challenges. I became pregnant, um, sort of by a surprise, as much as a, as much of a surprise as it can be. Right. We all know and how, how old happens. was your oldest daughter at this time? Um, she was like, three, two, three. She okay. Three. Yeah. Um, I became pregnant and um, thought, well, okay, this is cool. Like, new challenge. We'll see how this all plays out. And I started making plans to hire and associate my practice and work less hours and just do the things that I thought I had been wanting to do. But now I have like a legitimate excuse or reason to do them. Um, but unfortunately, I lost that baby. <sighs> but the kicker was that six weeks, sorry, eight weeks after the miscarriage, I was pregnant again. And at that point, I was like, hold on. <laughs> uh, like, I, there was nothing more important to me than having another healthy baby at that point. And so just a few weeks later, I sold my practice. And I did it quickly. Usually in our profession, we sell our, we sell our business. It's like, oh, awesome, congratulations. And while people were congratulating me, I was feeling like, no, it, I, this happens, like I sold my practice, not because I wanted to. I felt like I had no other option, right? Like I had to figure out how to take my, how to reprioritize my life and how to grow a healthy baby. And um, now looking back on it, I'm like, well, well, if my practice had been different at that time, I would have been okay. Like we would have been okay. Um, but it was just... So like my, my vision was so focused on my practice always has to be growing always, always, always that, um, I just didn't see another way. I didn't see another option. So yes, I sold my practice. I took a couple of years off of full-time practice and had that baby <laughs> and she's now, um, to be three in three days. And it was a year ago that I was like, I'm ready to be back in practice and like doing, doing the things that I want to do, right? That I, my, my mission was still the same. I wanted to own a business and I wanted to help people and I wanted to do that in a really big way. So it, it took me honestly, truthfully years to figure out that I could design a life around my business. Okay. So <clears throat> let's go back to being in practice. And you said, I felt like I had no other option than, than to sell. And then you said, my practice, like it just always had to keep growing. So mm -hmm. if you go back and you think about that practice now, um, what, what was it doing or what were you doing that made you feel like, you were kind of trapped. Oh, it was totally in my head. <laughs> it okay. was totally in my head. Right? Like I didn't have a good handle on my expenses and um, I was spending money on things in my practice that weren't necessary. So now I take a different approach to that I'm very lean in both of my businesses. I operate my practice and my coaching practice on less than $600 a month, both of them. Um, and I do that on purpose, right? Whereas before I was spending thousands of dollars a month and I felt all that immense pressure on me to make sure that I was always not just covering my expenses, but also being able to pay myself, of course, too, to provide for my family. Um, so looking back on it, yeah, I would have, I mean, like, if I could 
change that situation, I would uh, create a lot more clarity on my expenses and, and tighten them up, lean them up for sure. Um, but I didn't, and that's okay. <laughs> but a lot of it, to be honest, Dr. Barb, a lot of it was just really what's in my mind, right? Like the mindset of feeling fear around not being successful and feeling fear around um, if I if I let go a little bit and if I say, you know, I'm maybe not going to work as many hours or I'm going to say no to some opportunities that come my way to network or to market, that things will still be okay. We'll still make it. We'll still have a family. We'll still love each other. We'll still have the important stuff. Okay. So, so this brings us full circle. And those of you who, who follow Dr. Danielle or I, whether it's on the Women Chiropractors page or, um, or whatever it happens to be, there's kind of been a, de- I wouldn't say a debate, but a differences of opinion regarding, I would say, business philosophy. Mm-hmm. So I had, um, obviously, on a Women Chiropractors webinar, um, the, the other board members and I were talking about that practice is a lot of hard work, mm-hmm. that being successful in business, I don't care which of those 500 books that you read about the, the moguls in business, it's, it's a lot of hard work. And obviously there are other things that have to, um, I wouldn't say be sacrificed, but choices that we have mm-hmm. to make depending yes. on the outcome that we want to have. And so that yes. then kicked off a, a post of, if anyone tells you to work harder, block them, unsubscribe them. Um, I can't remember what the other things were. So let's talk about that because anyone that watches this will know that that conversation has gone on between the two of us. So let's talk about it. Yeah, I think that there's absolutely no way around, you, ha- you have to work if you want to have a business, right? As entrepreneurs, we have to be willing to do things that other people don't do. And um, my philosophy on like working smarter and not harder is largely about how there are so many women like me who are type A driven um, go-getters, like not just goal setters, but goal achievers, right? that when we are not doing those things, like if we have a period of life or a phase of life where we feel like I am not reaching the goals I had, that we feel like failures. And it, it's been so, it was damaging to me to have mentors in my life who told me I just needed to work harder when I was already working so hard. And it's not always that I really what would have been in my best interest? No, certainly hasn't always been was in my family's best interest for me to just work harder. I need to really make sure I work smarter for sure. So, so with that, um, in working in, in working smarter. So you 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 talked about a couple of different things. And I want to kind of bring it all into what have you found leads to burnout? Have you experienced burnout? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was what in the burnout f- phase when I miscarried and when I sold my practice for sure. Yeah. Okay. When you sold the, which one? My first practice. Oh, that the one at Afton. Yeah. Okay. So that was, that was the one that you sold when you got pregnant with your second daughter, right? When you didn't feel like, uh, you had any other option, you had to have it growing. That was also, you sold it because of burnout. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. So yeah. what, how does someone get to burnout? I think by not being clear on boundaries, um, not necessarily like uh, just personal boundaries, right. But, um, boundaries in regard to, in regard to business too, like, what is really important in your business? Sometimes we don't know. And, and truthfully, there's just phases of business where we're, we're not going to know. Right? Like, You might start your practice and not know who your niche is or who your ideal patients are. And you take all patients, right? That's, that's okay. That's a phase of growth. Um, 
But at some point along the way, I see this happen, not just to myself, but in others as well, like saying yes to everyone leads to burnout because we feel like we're giving our energy away to everybody and there's not an even exchange of that energy. Um, just not taking care of ourselves, not making ourselves a priority in this process. Right? I think that's a very easy pattern for us to fall into as moms, but also as moms who are healthcare providers, our hearts are so big and we want to give to other people. We forget to prioritize ourselves to fill our own, to fill our own cups, right? So that we do have something to pour. It's that cliche <laughs> saying, mm -hmm. but it's really so true. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so let's go back to goal achievers versus goal setters. Mm. Um, what's your philosophy on goal setting? Let's start with goal setting. Because obviously in order to be a goal achiever, you have to first set them, right? Yeah. Okay. You've got to have that clarity on where, where it is you want to go. Okay. Right? To, to be able to achieve a goal. Um, so sure, goals can be achieved by default or by chance or by luck. And I think that luck or chance happens for people that are taking action, for people that are doing the work, that are showing up, that are committed. Um, the difference between goal setting and goal achievement comes down to action. It's, but this is what my husband and I used to do on New Year's Day. We would get out a notebook we would write down our goals for the year in the notebook. And then we'd close that notebook and lay it on our countertop in our kitchen. And then stack like the newspapers that came or the magazines that came in the mail and bills and things that needed to be filed on top of that notebook. And we would leave it there for months. We didn't have an action plan. Right? We didn't like have a deadline for those goals. It would just kind of, it was more like a dream list really. Mm -hmm. But we weren't looking at it that way at the time. And then we'd find that notebook months later <laughs> and pull it out and go, oh, look, here's our goals that we wrote down for the year. Maybe we've achieved some of them, again, by chance, right? We're both hard workers and we both um, are always, we're just naturally, that's our personalities. We're always working towards something. So some of those things on our list may have been accomplished. But oftentimes there were many that we were like, oh, how are we going to do that in the next six months or three months, depending on when we found that notebook. And it took us probably <laughs> five years, I would say, of doing this and doing this yearly when we realized, you know, like we're getting, we're getting pretty lucky by writing this stuff down every year. But what would be different if we not only just wrote this stuff down, but we attached deadlines and we made a plan for how we're going to create these goals, right? And so now we're moving from goal setting to goal achieving. Of course, that's an example that, you know, it's more specific to my family and how my husband and I do things together as a family. Um, but I apply that same kind of philosophy to business and work in 90 day increments. So our brains can, can comprehend the time frame in which we're working. Sorry, I just had something pop up on my screen. And it's a short enough amount of time that we don't have time to let fear come up and create all kinds of stories about, well, I'll just get started later. Because there isn't later. You only have 13 weeks to take action on this specific goal and bring it to fruition. So how okay. can I answer a question? Yeah, 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 for sure. So, so, um, I have three more questions. So, um, who were the, like, who are your mentors? Who do you follow? Who are your gurus? Who's your coach? Um, my current coach is Ellen Scott. She's in California. Um, Did you say Ellen? Not, her, her name is French. It's like Helen, but with some, I'm not sure what the oh, name okay. are, but so it's pronounced like the letters L N, um, but quickly L N. Okay. Um, who else? Alex Sharfin, um, Todd Herman. 
they're not chiropractors, but definitely have been business mentors. Um, when I'm really feeling stuck or just really want like some loving, um, a pat on the back <laughs> and some reminder of who I am and what's inside of me, I call my mentor from Logan, Lenny Nelson. Um, he as crazy and um, out of this world as he is. And for those who watch, who might know him, they, you also know that I would say this to his face too. Who is it again, uh, Daniel? L um, Lanny Nelson. He's in Utah. He, he practiced in Utah and then moved to Missouri to work at Logan, and he is back in Utah now. Oh, okay. So he, um, I don't recognize, he must not have been there when I was there. No, he started working at Logan in 2005 oh. and left 2013-ish. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. No. Um, yeah, I call him. Um, thankfully, I, I'm really grateful that I can still do that, <laughs> that I can, still, I can still call him, and he knows me well enough to say, you're being, you're being silly, or have you forgotten what you're capable of, or whatever it is that you really need to hear at that moment, he can, he can give me that. <laughs> right on. Um, so then, um, so you had said that your overhead is 600 a month and about working, working smarter. What kind of automation stuff do you coach clients on? Yeah, that really depends upon the, the client. What does she want? Does she want to be creating um, an online presence that is automated? So maybe she's writing a blog post and it goes out to her email list. Or does she want to have more automation inside of her practice, per se, so that um, this isn't like technologically automated, but that asking for referrals is an automated part of her systems right? So that um, it's not something that she's just kind of passively receiving the referrals. It's an active part of her, of her practice growth plan. Okay. So then in closing, um, describe your ideal coaching client. Like what kind of mm -hmm. practice does she have? Um, what is her like, you know, typical family life? Um, you know, what, yeah. Let's go with those two. Yeah, my, my ideal clients are women that are moms. They have little ones. They want to, um, they either want to be or they are now working part-time, meaning they're working um, three or four half days a week or maybe three full days a week. And the rest of that time that they're not in their office, they're spending that time with their little ones, um, which is very much like me <laughs> as well, right? So Isn't my, three full days almost full time in our profession? Well, <laughs> I don't know too many. Like, I mean, I, really, we in our profession, most people work full days, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and maybe occasionally a half a half day others, right? Yeah, I think that um, a lot of us get to that point at some at some point in our career, but <laughs> what I see is that a lot of times when we're starting out we think that we've got to be available all the time for people right so not setting those clear boundaries again um, yeah so being in the office or working on the business um, four or five or six days a week yeah okay so moms who have little ones and they work part-time mm -hmm. and 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 what is the average income of your clients gross income mm -hmm. Great question. My clients typically see, well, it depends on when we start working together, right? I have some that we start working together, they're seeing 10 patients a week. They really need to increase their practice volume quickly. And others who now are up to seeing 70, 80, 90, 100 patients a week. Um, so there's a big difference in their income as well. Okay. And then so let's go back to mom, little ones, three full days is kind of like the, the maximum. What about a new, a new doctor who's those things? A mom has little ones and she's brand new into practice. Yeah. 
then what? Like, what, what is your advice to that person? Set boundaries from the start, right? Be clear on how you want to live your life, how you want to really spend your time from the start. And when we start, we may not know, but taking your best guess at it is far better than letting things happen by default. And, um, and knowing that it's okay to do that, it's more than okay, it's like necessary for us to do that, for us to take care of ourselves so that we can keep taking care of our patients for as long as possible. Okay, um, any last minute thoughts, comments? You know, that- Dr. Barb, I think it's so um, interesting that we, truthfully, our thought processes about practice are so much the same. Like as I listened back to a couple of your previous interviews with other guests, I was like, yes, like I never hear something that I feel like, oh no, I would never do it that way. Or like, no, my opinion is so much different. Like our mindsets about practice are very much the same and who we help is a little bit different. <laughs> That's interesting. I don't feel like that at all. I, yeah. I feel like we have a totally different mindset about about practice which is great i mean the very first interview that we ever did together the first conversation um when we described our ideal client i think it's yeah it's somebody totally different how we look at business i think um i think that it seems we have similar ideas about life and family and things like that but when it comes to business it's interesting that you feel that way i don't i don't feel that way at all um which is is great because obviously female clients um, and you coach only chiropractors or you coach other other women in business too I have one client who currently one client who is not a chiropractor okay um because obviously chiropractors come in all shapes sizes philosophies um (laughs) and, and I think you know I think Danielle I think one thing that we would agree upon with each other is um it's really important when, in my opinion, when choosing your mentor that you do understand their business philosophy. Um, yeah. I'm not a halfway person. I've never done halfway anything in my life. If I'm in, I'm in at a thousand percent and I'm driving hard. And yep. um, so, you know, my clients count on me to to hold them to higher standards. They, they define what those standards are. Obviously their goals are unique to what they want. Um, I never encourage anyone to set reasonable goals. I think that that's, you know, it, for me, everything comes back to something you said. Um, I felt like I had to be legitimate, congruent. And that was in, I think what you said you're, when you were at Logan and, and to me, that all comes back to um, how I coach my clients. Like, I, to me, optimum potential is optimum potential. Either living to your optimum potential, which means we're stepping out in huge ways that whatever we're doing, we're obsessed with it because an aid is either on or not. That it's, it's either, you know, I'd, I'd rather see my kids have a fever of 104 degrees and they're burning down the house to burn off that pathogen then they do the medical route of, oh, let's pacify it and let's just, you know, like kind of go slow because life, life doesn't work like that. Life works, you know, speed is the biggest friend of the successful entrepreneur. And, um, and so I think it's just, I think it's really important to any woman who's watching this is, is just make sure that you are, um, that you that you ask questions, I think about business philosophy, as well as, um, you know, uh, like I drive hard, I even talk hard. I I like, I I do that. And if you listen to the difference of how Danielle talks versus how I talk, it's a hundred percent different. And, and her way matches her clients and fits with her clients. And, um, you know, Maybe there's some similarities in in the systems that we coach, but I think mm-hmm. overall our philosophy is is different. And so I just really encourage um, you know women to also uh, you know I 
I don't think you don't do business as a hobby. I don't care who your coach is. Don't do business as a <laughs> hobby. You invested way too much time, energy, and money to do this thing as a hobby. Yeah. When you're there, be obsessed. Be obsessed with using your time. Be obsessed with connecting with people. Be be obsessed. Be obsessed in business. Be obsessed in motherhood. Be obsessed when making love to your spouse. Be be obsessed as a daughter, as a sister. Like just show up to be your best. And, and I've been at this a long time. So I've been coaching chiropractors since 1999. And I got to say that a hundred percent of the time when I see burnout, it's this, it's that the person is working extremely hard and not getting results for their work. So there's a misconception out there that it's hard work that leads to burnout. I promise you, you will not find that to be true. Not only in what I'm telling you, but study other other books, study other gurus, study other entrepreneurs. It's not true. Like where you get burnout is when you work really hard and you don't get the results for your work. And many times, like Danielle even said, like stuff in our head, many times we think that we're working harder than we actually are because we're worried so much whether you know, when we're at home, we're worried about work. When we're at work, we're worried about home. And we're never fully present wherever we are. And so life is just this big old blur. And it becomes so confusing because we're not obsessed with what we're doing. So yeah. I just, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to get this opportunity to, uh, to, like, for individuals to get to know you. And then I, I think it's, it's really good for them to see the differences as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would, I would encourage all of you who are looking for a coach or looking for a mentor as well to, you know, yes, look and see what our, our philosophies are as well. Um, but, but I think another thing is just, um, I think that your your tribe is different than probably, excuse me, my tribe. And, and the reason why is obviously those practices are different and how we coach them is different and, um, and whatnot. So I just, I, I encourage anyone watching this, whether you're watching it from my page or, or, or Dr. Danielle's page as well, like see yourself in like what tribe is, is not only going to nurture you, but require you to step up and, and be like the most incredible version of yourself and hold yourself to the same standards that you hold. And, and this has always been a philosophy of mine. Um, you know, as a Christian, I know that one of the biggest things of why kids don't want a relationship with the Lord going on in their life is they see hypocrisy in their parents' lives. And I've seen, I've seen that happen to so many um, you know, kids who were just raised in great homes and they wanted nothing to do with their parents because when you see the outside, like when you really get to see the internal workings of it, it was not, you know, like what was on the exterior was not the same as the interior. And so I wanted to make sure even as a single mom, I was a single mom most of my kids' lives that, um, that in, and I still obviously am not perfect at this, but I try really hard that, you know, if, if my chiropractic philosophy is optimum potential to drive hard, be our best, do everything we can to achieve higher and higher and higher and higher levels. And that's the standard I have for my kids. I, um, at least for me, that's also, um, you know, where I find you just like, that's where you really learn who you are is, is to, is to constantly grow and is to constantly expand and, <laughs> and to just like step out in fear. Like, you know, like Mel Robbins, the five second rule for anyone who hasn't listened to that, I highly recommend it. And she talks about teaching her son to look at fear instead of excitement. So like she was giving the story of they were driving over to a friend's house and he was so nervous to spend the night at his friend's house. And so she said, what if you just thought of it as being excited? Like my stomach is kind of queasy and I'm, I'm, I'm like all of that. And she's like, what if you just call it excited? And so he had to kind of think about it. And then before long, he actually wanted to put himself into those situations of being excited, which was, yeah. you know, kind of fear. And so I would encourage everyone to do that as well, because guess what? We expect our kids to do it. 
we expect our practice members, we, we expect our practice members during the report of findings to take action and follow our care instructions and to invest in their health and well-being on an ongoing basis and to drive hard and not to stop at symptomatic relief because that's what's best for them. And it's the same in our own lives and, um, and in our businesses. So um, I know I promised to keep this to 30 minutes and here we are at 38 minutes. So Dr. Danielle, no what is the no best worries. way for, um, for women to get in touch with you? Um, email is easiest probably. So would you like me to give my email address? Yeah. It's D-R-E-A-T-O-N, so Dr. Eaton, at DanielleEaton.com. So it's Dr. Eaton at, and then it's DanielleEaton.com, not Dr. DanielleEaton.com. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So it's Dr. Danielle at, Dr. Danielle at DanielleEaton.com. Okay. <laughs> Close. Okay. Dr. Eaton. Dr. Eaton at DanielleEaton.com. Oh, Dr. Eaton at, okay, <laughs> sorry. Dr. Eaton at DanielleEaton.com. All right. And mine, <laughs> mine is Dr. V at Dr. Barbara Eaton.com. It's all just DRs. It's not doctor spelled out. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I want to thank you so much. I really appreciate thank your time you. today. And for all of you who've stuck with us, all of these um, 38 minutes, thanks so much. Um, may the Lord bless you and your family. And, um, and please know that uh, struggle, it's a solitary journey, but success definitely takes a team. So no one has achieved greatness, even the likes of Michael Jordan, if you've never read Tim Grover's book, Relentless, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, even the likes of those individuals have an entourage. Um, yep. And I guess my parting words are, make sure that the mirror is your only comparison. Don't compare yourself to other people mm -hmm. because you don't know, you don't know their story. You don't know where they've been. You don't know, um, you don't know why they have what they have or why they don't have what they don't have. So use yourself and your own, your own potential as the only measuring stick by which you compare. And I promise you, life will, will definitely improve just for that one little tip. So thank you all. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Danielle. Thank Lots you, of fun. Everybody. Thanks for sharing your story and your uh, journey with us. My pleasure. All right.